Great. I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, I started already. Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm your host, Lisa. I'm here today with Venkat. Hey, Lisa. Welcome to Scorpio Season. Uh, hey, Venkat. Um, hey, so we usually have snacks. Do you have a snack that you're eating today? So if you're doing the letter U today, right? And U turned out to be really, really hard. So um, this is kind of a wimpy solution, but this is unsweetened chocolate. So unsweetened baking chocolate. It's the best I could do. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, I also had trouble with you. If I, uh, I'm eating unsalted nuts with some um, umami. I, I, I put some umami stuff on there, which is uh, Marmite has a lot of umami in it. So this uh-huh. is unsalted nuts with a little bit of... Umami <laughs> dipping sauce, aka okay, okay, Marmite. It's good. It's not bad. It's not salty. I don't think umami is on our list, but we should add it. But it's kind of interesting that both of us um, chose foods with negative prefix qualifiers, unsweetened and unsalted, right? And I think um, most words that begin with you are, in fact, in English at least, uh, unsomething prefixed words, right? I believe it, yeah. Yeah. I think I added to our list unknowns as one and all right. Yeah. So we should actually talk about that too, meta stuff. All right. So what are we doing? Where are we starting? Let's start at the top. Um, I don't actually remember who. So the first word we have on our list is underworlds. Um, which I don't actually remember who added this. This seems like something I might've done. Um, all right. So I, we'll put, I have, assume I you did it. So. Kick us off. Great job, Lisa. Um, I don't really think I have a lot to say about Underworlds. Actually, I don't know if this is related. Um, I've been reading this like book series by um, Garth Nix. That's like the Sa- Sabriel Aporson um, like series. I think there's like five or six books in it. Um, he's an Australian writer. It's one of my favorite like kind of fantasy novel, maybe like semi young adult category. Um, mm-hmm novel sets not a lot of people have you heard of this before I don't think no I've i haven't what's it called again um it's abhorson series by garth Nix. abhorson okay yeah so the underworld in um abhorson like the abhorson series is so there's like necromancers and dead so basically has like a zombie component because things come back from the dead um and the underworld there is a um it's like a river so when you go into death you end up in a river kind of like the river sticks, I guess. And there's different levels. I want to think there's, uh, let's say there's seven levels. And so there's gates that you pass through. And as you go down the river, pass through the gates, um, eventually you get to like, maybe it's the ninth bottom, seventh or ninth last part. Um, it ends. And then if you reach that far, you can never come back to life basically. So it's basically, um, there's kind of like the upper world that everyone inhabits. And then there's the death that really only necromancers can walk in death, Um, which is kind of cool. I guess that's like, so I guess like, I mean, if we're going to like outline sort of like what is an underworld, part of it is that they're not easy to get to, right? Like they have like defined boundaries between what's considered underworld and what's considered like above ground. Um, And you can accidentally end up in the underworld, like in death you can die. Can die, and if you die in the real world, you end up in this underworld, in the Garth Nix thing. Um, and if you die and getting, underground, um, you die in the real world. Too. Like I'm thinking of um, Inception, where going deeper into dream levels is like going underground into your own head or something. And yeah, like you go way deep. Like going under in general, I think there's connotations of uh, uh, the religious um, sort of some version of hell is usually underground. And then you've got like going under as in going deeper into your consciousness. So maybe there's some relation there. Like uh, why under, like uh, why is it that most cultures seem to think of like heaven as above and hell as below, right? Right. So that's, hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. Hmm, like what about our experience as humans makes us associate underground is maybe it's caves. I don't know. Um, I think it's caves have dangers in them, bears and stuff, but it might actually be the association of volcanoes and fire and uh, the underground, right? Like 
for primitive peoples, digging into the ground was like technically a really hard thing to do. And if you... It's still really hard, isn't it? I mean... Yeah, it's still hard, but we can now do it. Like I, I, like I visited the... Have you ever been to the Transportation Museum in London? I think so, yeah. Do you remember they have like huge exhibits on how the London Underground was built and all the techniques they had to construct for like constructing tunnels and things? Uh, so yeah, I think uh, if you think about like uh, the fact that voluntarily and intentionally going underground is has been hard for humanity to do, then you have to like turn to natural sources of going underground. And the only major ones really are volcanic um, pipes and things like that, right? You can go deep in and there's like other cave systems and they're dark and they're risky. You can die of like fire or drowning or something. So that must be one reason. But the, the, it seems like there's more to it than that. Well, Maybe, I, I mean, don't know. So if you take the underworld to like mean sort of like dipping into like maybe the mafia situation in New York City or um, kind of like, it's sort of like not liminal, but um, not really like widely accepted or talked about in like polite company kind of like, I don't know, how do you, like I feel like yeah. there's definitely an underworld in New York City, kind of like in commercial trash business, you can like brush into it. Um, and there's like, so there's like portals that you as like a mere mortal can like brush into the underworld through like its interfaces with normal life. Like so in New York City, I worked with a coworker when we were at a startup. Um, we moved to a new office space and they did some renovation to set the new office space up. Like they had a budget to like do some like whatever. So then they had construction trash and so commercial, commercial um, garbage collection is privately done, residential collections done by the city. Um, he tells the story, so the, the guy at the office who was running, I think is the chief of product who was running the whole renovation thing. Um, he tells a story about how he was trying to figure out, he had trash, he needed to get picked up, right? We got like all this like stuff, basically someone has to come pick it up. And so he kept calling all these different trash companies and he couldn't find one that would like service their area. You know, he'd give him the address and be like, oh no, we don't service that area. And it was like, he was like, it was real weird. He kept calling him and finally he found the one that serviced that block. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, we can like, here's our price. Here's how much it's going to cost you. And like, this is all we can, can come get it. But he was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure they have like mafia agreements of territory of who owns what. Oh. And so he couldn't get but they're not going to tell you that that's what you're brushing up against. You kind of have to just like discover it. If that makes sense. Like, I heard something about it in a, I might've mentioned this on a previous episode actually, uh, but a friend of mine he used to work at uh, McKinsey and he talked about a study that was done by McKinsey consultants on the optimal garbage uh, collection route in um, a major city. And it's like, you know, classical computer science graph traversal type problem. And they figured it all out and they went and reported it to the city. I think this was actually New York. And then they were laughed out of the room because it's like totally cannot be the optimal solution because it's carved up according to like mafia logic rather than, uh, you know, optimization logic. And uh, yeah, there's, a, uh, there's definitely a, a sort of relationship to the physical underground, right? There's the underground railroad and parts of the underground railroad were literally underground. Uh, sewage tunnels and things like that have often been used both by like um, uh, the criminal classes and subversive rebels and then just people trying to sort of um, escape from oppressors and things. So it's like a gray area, like during the uh, World War II, I think the French resistance underground, the Maquis, uh, it was like a mix of criminal classes as well as freedom fighters. And I think uh, an occupied country both go underground and the lines between them start to blur. Like I'm trying to think of other examples. Like I lived in Vegas for a couple of years and Vegas is famous for a bunch of storm drains that go under the strip. And you know you can go from like the underground parking lot of Caesar's Palace to like some point just outside of the strip where it comes out. So I actually went and explored those. Um, a reader of mine, um, she was visiting and she's one of the few people I think who I would count as crazier than you. So she dragged me along to 
explored the underground tunnels and did some research and apparently it's full of like drug addicts who might attack you, but it's famous for lots of graffiti. I, I wrote a post about this, uh, so it's like 2011. But yeah, we went in with like uh, flashlights and uh, did the exploring. The graffiti was really cool. We didn't run into any homeless drug addicts, but uh, we saw their like, encampments and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was like my one exploration of a literal underground. There's, there's actually it's a big book about it. So it's actually like an underground. Like it's got, it's got people that are kind of not in surface society that are living down there too. Like it's Literally. not just a location. It's like actually got a community to some extent yep. there. And Vegas is special because it's one yeah. of the, uh, when I was living there, I had this thought that it's kind of like the trash can of the US where people end up when they don't have any clear idea of where else they could go to do something with their lives. And I was thinking that because at that time I was also in that mood. I just quit my job and was just starting my free agent career. So we ended up in Vegas for like random reasons. My in-laws have um, had a house there uh, but there's no other good reason to be there. And I realized that everybody huh. else in Vegas is kind of like that. Like people visit to like gamble or for vacation, but people who actually live in Vegas, there's only like three reasons. One is you work for the military. So Nellis Air Force Base and Creech are there, uh, or you are the uh, casino industry, or you are hoping to make it into the entertainment industry, or you don't know what to do with your life. So you land in Las Vegas uh, wondering what the hell to do. And a lot of the second category ends up like the third category because the entertainment business is worse than the startup business. Most people trying to like, you know, get a stage act in Vegas fail. And these are like musicians and jugglers and all these people. And these are the people who end up as sort of the underground uh, sort of fallen through the cracks of society people. Uh, and it's kind of funny. So you see this all over Vegas. It's like the weirdest conversations you overhear in coffee shops. And it, it, it's telling that the underground is famous for artwork. It's like artistic people failing and going underground and doing graffiti. Anyway, that's, huh. that's at least my theory of it. Yeah, that's interesting. But I think it's like, I like how you, you kind of like point out Las Vegas is like a portal. Like it's like a place where there's like the inner, it's like there's holes there that you can like fall into like an underground that like exists and like Las Vegas has like I think every city kind of has that right like yep. you get homeless you fall out of your career or whatever but like places where entertainers are trying to make it that's probably a larger population and a little more holy um yep. and actually has the physical infrastructure to like support that kind of ideal and I think you can fall through the cracks in two different ways. One is by sort of being a failure and falling through the cracks at the bottom of society. And the other is if you're like rich and privileged enough, you can access a different kind of underground scene, right? Like, you know, uh, secret yeah. clubs and like um, exclusive access spaces that only the rich and powerful get into. Like uh, the speakeasies of uh, the prohibition era. Like, did you ever watch that uh, show? What was that on Atlantic City? with uh, Steve Buscemi, I think. Anyway, so Atlantic City during the prohibition had like a huge network of speakeasies and like, well, illegal drink economy, basically alcohol economy. So that's another yeah, kind of underground, underground economy. So like prohibition to some extent made the interface of the underworld for most like, like, I don't know, normies a lot closer, right? Because they had to interface yeah. with the underworld in order to get liquor which was like going to speakeasies right so like i don't know how much it was still for normies because i think of normies as kind of the law-abiding middle segment of society that um, tends not to break the rules either way either because they're too desperate and have nothing to lose or they're too rich and powerful and can sort of bend the system in their favor they don't belong in either tail of the distribution they're in the middle so when something like prohibition happens it's often that the middle class shrinks so that there's still a normal band. So this would be people who kind of like agreed with the temperance movement and decided that alcohol was evil and stopped drinking maybe. So I would have defined, I would have redefined normies for those times. Like it actually takes a particular personality to break, you know, the societal norms. Like most people are kind of conformists mm -hmm. that way.
I guess, but like my understanding of prohibition, or at least the way I was attempting to say, and I don't have any like evidence to back this up, but my understanding was that in general, it made more, it pushed more people out of the normie thing because they wanted to drink. And so they were engaging in illegal activity in order to drink. Um, so it was an expansion of the like interface between like ex normies, I guess, and the underworld. Yeah, I guess. I, yeah, I agree that a lot of people probably made the transition. Uh, so in, in a way, I, I think we're saying the same things. Um, the band of normies kind of shrank and narrowed and more people were willing to sort of uh, become transgressors, uh, which is, I think, an interesting question in itself. Like, what makes people go underground? Like right now, actually, a lot of people are doing that. If you look at the Portland um, protests and uh, now it's spread to Seattle, there's uh, people who for the first time in my life, I'm hearing talk like, uh, I don't know, like they're part of a guerrilla resistance movement in an occupied country. So they're, that kind of rhetoric is starting to enter in the way a lot of people talk. People who uh, like six months ago, I would have considered sort of in the normal band. Like I sometimes think about that, like what provocation would push me underground? It would take a pretty extreme provocation because I'm like an extremely bougie, uh, normie, law-abiding person. Yeah, it's funny. I actually had a conversation with a friend over this over the weekend that was a similar. He was, I think, he was a lot more cognizant of it. He called it kind of his like bright line of like what would have to happen for him to. I don't know. I think his like his version of going underground was to like flee to Canada. Um, like, at what point would he pull, like, that seems like the more bougie version of undergroundishness, right? It's actually not, it's not, that's like not going underground. That's, um, I don't know. That's more exit, right? You're not actually becoming a transgressor within a country. You're, so uh, actually, yeah, let's back up. Let's connect this to uh, exit versus voice. You're familiar with that, right? We've, I think we've talked about it before. Oh, it's the Albert O. Hirschman classic book, um, Exit Loyalty and Voice. So no. basically, oh, this was a very popular idea like four or five years ago. Um, but basically, it's a classic political science book that says that when you're dissatisfied with the system, as a member of a system, if you're dissatisfied mm -hmm. with it, there's basically two ways you can sort of express your dissatisfaction. You can either voice your dissatisfaction, which means stay within the system and become a protester or something along those lines or you exit, you just leave the system and go to another system. So going to Canada would be an exit move, whereas anything on the range from like uh, legitimate within the rules, protesting all the way to like active black block, um, subversive activity, things like that, that whole spectrum would be voice because you're staying within the system and uh, with or without like legal or violent means, you are subverting the system, right? So this is voice. So going underground is an act of voice. Um, it can be an act of voice. It's, it's not necessarily only an act of voice. Some, sometimes you go underground for other reasons, right? Right, yeah. Well, even that is an act of voice. Like if you're going into the underground economy and trading without paying taxes or whatever, or like trading goods that are not uh, legal like drugs, then you are going, you are exercising voice in the sense of, I will be, through my economic transactions, I'm claiming that your rules about what can be traded are illegitimate, right? So you're expressing voice. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's, I think we kind of pointed out an interesting um, kind of meta like a thing about what draws the line between the underworld and not it tends to come from the state. Like with prohibition, the um, expansion of, or like making a thing illegal expanded the underground. Um, and in the same way, maybe we'll see like these rules about um, rioting or like, I don't even know, public protests um, kind of changing the how many people find themselves in the underground, which may not have otherwise. Yeah, I think it's like half right to say that an underground only exists in relation to the state because I think an underground can also exist in relation to um, community. So you've mm -hmm. got like uh, the formal state or um, how do you call it? Gesellschaft or is it Gesellschaft? I think it's Gesellschaft. 
So Jesselshaft and Gemeinschaft, the sociology concepts, the formal structured state and the idea of like community, the softer, like general neighborhood norms kind of thing. Mm, uh, okay. And the example I'm thinking of of that is uh, like the movie Dirty Dancing, right? That yeah. was, um, yeah, an example of a community enforcing its norms of what was a decent dance and not. And you have an underground dance scene that's not necessarily illegal, but is enforced by like community norms for what's moral or not. Right. Yeah, so yeah. you can go underground on either or both dimensions, like socially or um, civil state wise. Um, uh, but you so brought up another really interesting, um, you mentioned um, the liminal aspect of going underground, right? And I think that connects to another item I put on the list, the uncanny. Right. I was looking. Okay, that was what I was about to like. It's like transition to whatever. All right. Like, Let's talk, talk about, about the uncanny. Because um, like, so I feel like the the way that I hear uncanny the most in like SV culture um, is, or maybe just like computer computer it computer literate culture is um, uncanny valley, uh, which is the place where something is realistic enough that you sort of believe it's a real thing. Like usually you talk about it in terms of like robots um, that you come in contact with or like sex dolls. So like, mm -hmm. let's say like, um, like there's like a sex doll that's like, it's it looks good enough that you kind of think it looks like a human, but it's not f high fidelity enough to like completely be a, um, a what do they call it in economics? Like a, a substitute. Um, so it's not like a, it doesn't, something about your brain like does the pattern matching that it's so close but off and that like offness you end up in uncanny valley they call it where um the experience is like almost exactly is almost what you're looking for but like some amount of off the the off the little bit of offness makes it way weirder than if it hadn't been that close to begin with um yep and so it's and the the almost at your goal, but like not like the offset distance between where you're trying to end up and where you actually end up um, makes for a worse like experience or like your it hurts your brain to contemplate this uncanniness. So they call it like uncanny valley. Um, yeah, it's um, I, I saw some literature on that a couple of years back where they were trying to like measure it empirically and uh, see if the uncanny valley actually exists. And I think it turned yeah. out inconclusive. But I think anecdotally, it's a sort of robust idea that it does exist where it's, um, yeah, I think the closeness, the qualitative measure of the close enough to be sort of um, creepy, but you don't know why is it's close enough that um, the small discrepancies between what you expect to see and what you do see uh, are too subtle for you to actually consciously sort of focus on and say, hey, that's why that creeps me out. Like for example, uh, we are used to a normal rate of blinking, right? Uh, another person blinking mm -hmm. is a, this is a particular normal rate. And if some sort of robot has that parameter tuned wrong and it's blinking too slowly, it may be too subtle for you to pick up on, but it uh, creates this sort of gestalt effect of uncanniness. And I think one of the things that happens is when something looks uncanny and initially you have this whole holistic sense of weirdness, but then you sort of zero in on why it looks uncanny, sometimes that feeling can dissolve because then it's like, instead of being generically anxiety provoking, it's like, oh, it's just the thing is not blinking fast enough. And then the rest of it sort of figures itself out. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting that that's become the usage um, that most of us in sort of the tech world use uh, these days, uncanny as an uncanny valley. But as, yeah. uh, I think before I heard it in tech, I mostly heard it in... Um, uh, fantasy literature. I don't remember one, but it's a word that comes up in like fantasy writing, right? Like the uncanny as sort of the zone between the realm of ghosts and fairies and things like that and um, normal humans. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's a different sense of uncanny. Yeah, I, I kind of forgot that was the thing, but you're right. So say more about this like realm of like, so like fairies, it's like the place that fairies inhabit or it's where things are like not quite I think they used to call them uncanny folk. Like uh, this is a British thing. So it's British folklore and I'm not quite sure of my grounding here, but um, the sort of general sort of British subculture or slightly underground subculture of like 
uh, gypsies and fortune tellers and witches and like uh, I'm not talking about like fantasy witches but like people actually practicing Wicca. Uh, all those people are um, kind of like in the uncanny valley of society itself. Like they're not quite people, you could say, right? Like there's a, there's a lot of this. Uh, British culture seems to have an especially large number of these things, like trolls living under bridges, witches. Uh, I'm thinking of one thing in particular, like, again, if you've been to London, if you go down to the riverside, there's a part of it, I forget what the market is called. There's a market of like fresh cheeses and stuff that mm -hmm. used to be a marketplace of uh, weird folk. That's what it was called. Like literally people would show up with like, you know, charms and magic amulets and things like that. So historically that part of London, the riverfront, which is now a farmer's market basically, used to be that kind of uncanny market where you'd go if you wanted to do shady deals with the underworld, right? <laughs> like mm. you feel your neighbor has cursed you, so you go find the local witch to get uncursed. Uncurse you, huh? That's funny. It's kind of nice to know that there are, um, there used to be like places that serve those needs, right? Like you would know where to go if you need it, if you had a problem that you needed solved. Um, yeah, yeah, I think like, well, I guess this is more an underworld. It, there's a great book by Samuel Delaney um, called Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. It talks kind of about how, I don't know if Times Square is necessarily as uncanny. This is again, like more of an underworld, but like there was an underworld um, that existed around Times Square before they cleaned it up. It's actually kind of funny. Okay, so Times Square used to be like, have this underworld um, with like a bunch of like, um, kind of like sex movie theaters and that kind of like scene um and then they cleaned it up and I feel like they cleaned it up and proceeded to make it a very uncanny place so like it's no longer an underworld but it's still uncanny place you find yourself because of like just the mass corporate culture-ness of what they've replaced it with like the m, &M world and um I don't know what else is over there but it's like a, it's an uncanny, like, it's kind of an uncanny valley. I mean, it's literally a valley. You like, go and like, are staring down at all the like ads um, around you. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that uh, things that are sort of the contrast of uncanny can also themselves become uncanny. Like um, a surreal area of like commercialization that's like, in a way, like so commercial it goes up over into its own kind of uncanniness or the Stepford Wives, right? So normally you would think of like the underground um, as like skeevy characters in dive bars or something, but then the Stepford Wives is uncanny in like a, a, a too perfect suburbia with uncanny robot-like uh, inhabitants, right? So that's a different kind of uncanny where you're too close to normal. Instead of too close to the edge of normal, you're too close to normal or something like that. Well, it's not even normal. It's the fantasy of normal, right? It's like the yeah. over-normalization. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, so, who was it who called it hyper-normalization? The Adam, what's his name, uh, who does the documentaries. Uh, so he had a new documentary called Hyper-Normal. So that gets into that a little bit. So uncanny as sort of a sign of approaching a boundary either to like too idealized normal or too close to the weird, right? So it's it's approaching the boundary of any sort, which means in a way being normal means being not too normal or not too abnormal. It's like a recursive uh, self-violating definition. <laughs> Mediocre, me mediocrity almost, could one yes, say? Yes, I don't know. exactly. Um, okay. You have to be normal, but in a mediocre way. Yeah, like uh, you can't be too normal, that's yeah. weird. It has um, to, the edges of normalcy have to fray. Uh, all right. But I think we've been sort of, um, oh, uh, I wanted to mention one more specific example of the underground. So Seattle actually has an underground Seattle kind of tour. And um, you can take it for like 15 bucks, but it goes through all the underground tunnels. There's like trolls, um, there's like statues of trolls under bridges and things like that. <laughs> so it's one of the popular tourist attractions of Seattle. Oh, that's fun. Cool. Um, we'll have to link to that in the Twitter thread so people can check it out if they're in Seattle. Um, now it might actually know. contain protesters and stuff. Who knows? Oh yeah, it might be. It might be an actual underground tour, underworld tour of Seattle yeah. underground. So um, speaking of, I don't know. Uh, I kind of want to talk about unboxing stuff. Um, 
Oh, okay. Checking things out of boxes. Because um, you used to live in Seattle, but you moved from Seattle to LA, right? About a year ago. And then yep. recently you moved again. You from, um, I understand, downtown LA, and now you're out in Hollywood. Somewhere? I'm in Hollywood. I'm in Hollywood. Hollywood. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, it's my. To the silver screen or. <laughs> It's, it was just the right sort of um, mix of cost and square footage for us. And it turns out to be, Hollywood is actually a pretty nice neighborhood to live in. It's uh, the actual downtown Hollywood with its walk of um, fame with all the stars on the pavement. That's kind of really, uh, how do I put it? It's, it's a really tourist trappy, crappy kind of neighborhood. It's like much more ghetto than you think. Uh, but mm-hmm. the rest of Hollywood is kind of nice. Good food, good shopping and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, this is my, I think, 22nd move in 22 years. So I have averaged like one move a year for like 22 years now. And wow. it's insane. But for some reason, uh, somebody was actually suggesting a theory that uh, one of the symptoms of like inequality in the economy and the urbanization and like, you know, cost being too high in urban areas is, and stuff is, uh, people in the middle class world, it's hard for us to stabilize anywhere permanently. Like if you're really poor, you'll be stuck in like some poor neighborhood for life. If you're really mm-hmm. rich, you can kind of find a place that completely fits your needs and like live lavishly there forever. But if you're in the middle, you kind of have to move a lot as your circumstances change and you know, you're working on different things and stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, so 22nd move in 22 years and um, I've become really good at putting things in boxes and taking them out of boxes, even as the number of boxes has increased uh, a lot. Like my first move, I think was uh, from Ann Arbor to Austin, actually. Uh, No, actually it was within Ann Arbor. That was a small, like one suitcase move. When I started grad school, I went from one apartment to the other. That was easy, just one suitcase. But my first kind of of like true move was Ann Arbor to Austin for like a year long internship. And that was like, six boxes that I mailed to myself, six UPS Mm -hmm. medium sized boxes. And then I drove my car down. This move I've had, uh, uh, it's almost embarrassing to admit, but 90 boxes. So that's a huge amount that it's like you accumulate stuff. And this is after a lot of elimination. Like at one point we used to move around with uh, 35 or so book boxes. So the book boxes are the small size. And now I'm down to like about, 20 so we've gotten rid of a lot of physical books but so much of it is like random shit like uh, a lot of the overhead is created simply by moving a lot like some apartments have poor kitchen cabinetry so you need like little extra shelving to create more space other apartments have better cabinets but if you don't want to keep buying and selling the same sort of storage equipment you kind of like pack it up and put it away so it's like compress, decompress um, your sort of uh, lifestyle algorithm, you're sort of compiling onto new hardware each time. So, uh, yeah, and each so it time- like you've kind of written like your fourth that you bring with you, like your, your like the base language that you want on all your platforms. Um, yeah, it's uh, unfortunately, it's kind of like a Java virtual machine, kind of like yeah. <laughs> bad enterprise uh, middleware kind of thing. But yeah, I think- A lot of boxes, yeah. Yeah, it, you can call it an LVM, I think. Lifestyle virtual machine. We should actually okay. make something up right, like that. But yeah, it's like some of this furniture we've had for like um, between three to 20 years, depending on the piece you look at. And some of it we've carted around for like five or six moves without using them. And then suddenly it's used again on the seventh move or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's like weird the extent to which I kind of basically reproduce the same organization patterns in every new sort of hardware layout. It's like I set up my desk in similar ways, similar things go in the shelves in similar places. Um, So yeah, that's like compiling to a virtual machine, some sort of byte code. Yeah, yeah. uh, Yeah, unboxing. I've been doing a lot of unboxing. You can see some boxes in the background over there. And this time, oh yeah, I did something interesting. Usually it's like just shove it in with some sort of order and then when you're opening up you've forgotten what you put in which box so it becomes mm-hmm. like almost um, a big annoying christmas where you're like 
unwrapping presents to yourself. And then like my un unpacking experience is usually like, I, I'm not stopping my unboxing until I find my coffee machine. So when I wake up tomorrow, I'll have coffee. It's that kind of milestone driven. This time for the first time, I made a spreadsheet while I was packing. So I had like a rough idea of um, what was in each box. So mm -hmm. it was much more instead of like brute force, uh, random unboxing of like open, 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 see where I put something. It's more like look in the spreadsheet box number 36 has coffee machine. So mm -hmm. then it becomes a slightly shallower search because now there's stacks of boxes everywhere. You have to go find where box number 36 is buried. Do some like, you know, uh, you know, towers of Hanoi kind of rearrangement and restacking <laughs> of blocks to pull out number 36, then right. pull out the coffee machine. So it's, uh, I've gotten better. I could write a book on moving, I think. Yeah, sounds like it. That's yeah. a lot of How often have you moved? I counted it once. It's a lot. It's up there. It was once a year for a while. And then I got to SF. I guess I was only in SF for two years. I didn't move when I was in SF. And then haven't moved since I've gotten to Houston, but I've only been here about a year. So and roughly about a year. So, oh, but if you count all the moves to like Brazil and stuff, do those count as moves? I can't tell. Um, they count as like extra special lot. moves, I think, because um, you're like moving oh. to an entire new country. Yeah, but I didn't have to like furnish a place when I get down there. It's like slightly different. Like it's just suitcases and stuff. And then you kind of inhabit space for a few months and then move back. And yeah, I've, I've moved or I've moved in. It probably averages out to about once a year or the last like 12 years. So. Okay. So you're, but now you're a homeowner. So you probably are going to stay put, right? Unless we'll you Airbnb. Well, I'm working on Airbnb being out. I was actually so I was posting on Twitter, sketching up how I want to remodel a bathroom. And I, I taught I saw myself that. that was awesome. That this weekend, I learned how to. I had a friend who was like shown me a few like a ten minute demo on how to pull things places. I don't know what piece of software he was using, but I like went on to like. Yeah, I took a few days off over the weekend. I don't know. Anyways, I had some extra time this weekend because I got to do all my tours on Friday because I was off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah so anyways yeah I spent some time I think I'm gonna redecorate and like remodel a bathroom so I can rent it out if it has a bathroom I can like rent it out and make yes. rental income so you know I'm like doing the whole like oh if I make x dollars a month and I'm here for five years how many how much can I spend on the remodel and still make money just by renting this room out of course you'll make money too by like updating the bathroom because that like adds to the house value because that this house yep. is like this stuff hasn't been updated since the 90s. Um, okay. So it's overdue for, re it's like, it's time to remodel it. But, um, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how much budget I can do. And I got my little cat done. Man, doing cat is terrible because now I can see it. And I'm like this close, like getting a, like a hammer and starting to rip things apart to figure out like where, Cause like I have the plan and now I need to know where to put all the pipes and stuff to make it happen. And the only way to do that is like rip flooring out. So like, I, like I'm kind of like, I'm like, no, Lisa, don't destroy your like drywall right now. Like hold off. I know you want to know where the pipes go, but like find a contractor first. Like maybe you can hire a plumber to do that as like a feasibility. Wait, study. wait so you're not remodeling an existing bathroom. There's an actual extension. You're actually making a new bathroom. I'm making a new bathroom. There's a ma okay, I'm so burning a closet into a bathroom. So I have a, two bathrooms upstairs. So there's aren't one there like uh, zoning regulations for that? Like, can you do that? Why couldn't <laughs> I? Why can't I? I don't know. Uh, why not? I'm gonna. Name I don't know. Well, I think there is like permits and stuff for extension, or I don't know. Well, if it's all inside the same house, I think you're okay. Okay. I asked my friend who's a realtor and she just said like, make sure you keep a closet in each bedroom for it to count as a closet. It, to count as a bedroom when you sell it, it has to have a closet. So I had to like tweak my CAD drawing to make sure every bedroom still had a closet. Um, Cause I'm getting rid of like the only place to put this is in the closet for the master bedroom. It's going to be fine. Wait, but. how did we get on the subject of CAD? What? Uh, I'm trying to remember how we got the, on the subject of like CAD modeling. Oh, sorry. Unboxing moving places. And I was oh, okay, like, yeah. oh, right. I won't That's be for a while. I'm just being um, alphabet police where I'm trying to like make sure that oh. we have a legitimate path from something starting with U to 
uh, whatever topic we're talking about. So unboxing, unboxing. to houses to 3D unboxing. CAD modeling of unbox. Yeah, that yeah, is. yeah, we're a little far. It's a little tangent if you measure it by like graph distance. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see, should we talk about something else on our list? We've got, no, let's, uh, um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, 3D. So you're using SketchUp, right? Yeah. Yeah, I used it for like a couple of hours, but I kind of like found it awkward. Like, did, did you enjoy it? Like, did you do some of the Ruby? I think it allows Ruby scripting and stuff, right? So I didn't need it. I didn't even look at that. I just like, all I needed was to like mock up my house and it it was really easy. Like for some reason, it I... I had like zero trouble figuring out how to manipulate all the tools except the one thing where I couldn't figure out how to like rotate objects since I ended up with like a toilet like at a really weird angle because it wasn't I couldn't get the like rotation working correctly but I figured it out um oh I think um yeah, the stuff has gotten really good since uh, I was in engineering school like I remember AutoCAD 3D that I used in the mid 90s was mm. like really primitive and annoying um, but now it's like getting more and more gamified um, mm -hmm. it's super fun i actually texted it to my mom i just i was texting it to like a lot of people because i was very proud of myself um i texted it to my mom and her response was like oh yeah i used the first version of autocad when it came out in 1983 when she was in engineering school um, she graduated from college in 84, but AutoCAD came out like the year before she graduated. So she got to use the first version of AutoCAD. It's kind of weird. And uh, now that you're doing uh, SketchUp and 3D modeling, you can build stuff for VR as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, next week we are talking about VR and uh, yeah, I'll show off my Oculus. Uh, yeah. Have you, you've tried, uh, I think I saw you post once about VR, right? Uh, yeah, I've, I've tried the original Oculus. My friend a few weeks ago sent me a picture of me like five years ago trying the first Oculus that he got, like a dev kit. Um, I have, like, it's, a uh, yeah, I think I, that was when I first tried it as well. It's, uh, it's gotten a lot better. The Quest that I bought like six months ago is, uh, yeah, some of the games are really good, some of the games and software. It, there's also like 3D, if you like SketchUp, you'll, I think, enjoy some of the uh, 3D drawing tools. They're really cool. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Um, we should, yeah, I'm excited about talking about that next week. That sounds good. Um, I'm getting these dings from my text message. Somebody's trying to like um, log into my Facebook. It's been happening since the morning. It's really annoying. Hmm. Yeah, so I just turned on two-factor authentication. We should talk about two-factor authentication at some point. Oh, you know what we yeah. should do? We should extend our alphabet series to alphanumeric. We should talk about zero through nine at some point. Yeah, we could do that. That sounds like fun. <laughs> um, um, sorry about that interruption. Yeah. All right. So um, we'll talk about VR next time. So what else do we have? On uh, we've got unknowns, universe, and umami. Unknown Mommy. universe and Numami. That's all right. You pick. Mm, I kind of want to talk about. Well, I want to talk about universe because I've, I've been thinking about these unforced books, <laughs> which are like a universe thing. Um, Wait, you've been thinking about what? The books I mentioned at the beginning, the ones oh, okay. with the underworld and like the necromancers and stuff. But I don't know. Um, one thing. I, so one thing that occurred to me about this universe, I guess it's kind of hard to talk about with people who haven't necessarily read the books, but. Um, the as a universe a lot of the like different characters all belong to different institutions so like and it's like it's weird because it doesn't start out that way like the the series is like very like fighting zombies um but you have to have like a universe that you're fighting the zombies within that they exist in and as it like goes along like i feel like the characters like more and more institutions get developed and so like every character kind of has like an institutional affiliation um, where they like live and spend most of their time like being a member of this like institution and then at, at one point he even like as a like um, what do you call it um, mechanic of storytelling like guilds get introduced so like mm -hmm. there's like a capital city and normally the capital like so there's like this land called old kingdom and normally it's run by like three kind of like special bloodlines like the king and his bloodline and then there's also the like um good necromancers called the apportions that fight death for the good of the people in old kingdom so um 
you know, when these bloodlines get weak and like kind of because there's no bad things happening. So like the kingdom okay. kind of goes into this, like there's one period of the kingdom where it goes into sort of like super posh mode and like all the old bloodlines kind of get watered down and like the king has problems and like the abhorsons get into horse racing. So they're like not really doing their like death stalking stuff anymore. And during this period, he introduced guilds. And so like a lot of the um, storyline then is around like the guild battles and stuff. But every like, every like character has like a an institution that they represent and that they're a member of and that they um kind of have like these like I don't know how you call it um like their lifestyle is about living with other people and like fulfilling their role in an organization um which I thought was interesting because like like do we have like am I the member am I like so like if we bring this back to like the universe of like real universe um reality is like kind of its own universe of characters and stuff um like it's sort of interesting to think like oh is within my universe like do I belong to like an institution or is there like a guild that I belong to um are, are humans like happier when they're embedded in universes with like institutional like affiliations that they can like um I think um yeah, it's, it's it's like basically the unit of social organization that sort of makes a world and connecting it back to like um, the first topic we were talking about, like, you know, uh, underground and uncanny and things like that and how mm. um, throughout history, like weird folk and queer folk or whatever they call themselves in various places and times, they are not necessarily a formal institutional guild, but they're like... Um, uh, I like the word, word folkway. So uh, uh, this is uh, David Hackett Fisher's book, uh, Albion Seed, talking about how four folkways from Britain colonized America. So there were like um, the Plymouth Rock people, then Jamestown, then the Quakers, and uh, what was the fourth, fourth one? Uh, Scots Irish and Appalachia. So these are like, like not necessarily institutions or guilds in the sense of like, you know, weavers or like soldiers or something like that, but they're like well defined sort of, uh, I don't like to uh, use the word community because a community implies a bunch of people who know each other and are like literally part of the same um, group. Whereas a folkway is more like people who are part of the same larger culture. So two villages that don't even interact and are very far apart on different ends mm -hmm. of the country might still be part of the same folkway, the same pattern of life, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of what uh, uh, creates um, this sort of social warp and woof of uh, a universe and when I think about like um, fictional universes and so, sort of sidebar is what's the difference between world building and universe building and my thought is it's a universe if there can be multiple parallel stories that don't talk unless they want to like Marvel Cinematic Universe you know mm -hmm. Spider-Man stories don't have to talk to Iron Man stories they can kind of live in their own little world within that universe well, and right talk and crossover events when they want to. Uh, so it's a, a universe is like a weekly couple set of worlds and a world is a set of uh, people who kind of know each other and interact socially. Uh, whereas a universe is worlds that may or may not collide um, in some ways. So I'm, for example, Marvel, I'm thinking of, if you look at the cinematic and television universe, the cinematic universe, all the characters kind of like uh, uh, interact and um, work together and go on adventures together. But there's also the television universe with its uh, uh, different characters like uh, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, uh, Luke Cage. That set of stories, you can tell that with like vague references that it sort of belongs in the same universe, but it's not um, coupled. The stories don't interact much. So you, you could say they belong to different folkways within the Marvel Cinematic Universe, something like that. Right. Yeah. Do you think that you inhabit like like, do you think that, do you think that you inhabit, like, so, like, your life, like, would you say that you inhabit a universe, a world, like, um? Huh. I think I'm, to some extent, I've moved between worlds quite a bit, or, but to another extent, I think, uh, because I have a fairly public blog with events and things attached to it, slowly a sort of um, world has emerged around it that I kind of drag around with me, which is kind of weird because it sounds kind of presumptuous and uh, uh, self-important to say that, but that's one of the interesting things about the internet. You don't have to be like 
a king or a you know big important person to like become the nucleus of some sort of um, folkware or something but yeah uh, i would say definitely i've jumped worlds like india to grad school in the us was one jump then grad school is sort of its own larger universe like each university is a world within the universe of academia right moving okay, from yeah. michigan to cornell i a lot of there was a lot of overlap a lot of the same research community talking to each other but it was like a different world and then to the corporate world which is another overlapping world but then the big jump was to free agency and becoming a blogger that's like almost in a different parallel universe so maybe we should sort of like expand our ontology to worlds become universes and then universes form multiverses because a multiverse is one degree of like separation even further apart right yeah cuz so, you could almost see your life like continuing in one direction if you stayed in that universe versus you like branched into a, a different universe so you have a different like exactly Yeah. and you can kind of see it when you compare yourself to friends who stayed where you left right yeah, like exactly. i recently went back to ann arbor and i met up with friends who i last saw like you know 20 years ago and they they're like middle aged people with like a 12 year old kid right now and it's like okay so that's sort of some sign of an all life for me same thing mm-hmm. i sometimes meet people who still work at xerox and i'm like all right, right. that was like my world 10 right. years ago go Right. Doesn't that kind of like blow your brain a little bit like when you meet people who are still in the same universe you left like a decade ago and it's like oh you like that universe still exists and it has continued on and like <laughs> still has like plots and storylines and stuff and it's like still happening it's like I mean you left it right and like so for you it ended like that's that universe kind of closed but it's it continued without you that's actually an interesting question depending on your personality type there are people who tend to join a scene when it's heating up and exit it when it's cooling down so to some extent their entries and exits mirror the sort of rise and fall of those worlds themselves so uh, i would say i joined xerox in sort of the shoulder of its decline so xerox as a sort of important famous company was 1970s that's when it sort of did its 60s and 70s was when it was like a growing uh path setting trend setting kind of company in mm-hmm. the 80s it started declining but it was still kind of there then in the 90s it had another sort of um, resurgence but in the 2000s it was on its slow decline i joined in 2006 and it was already sort of an old uh, uh, historic company it's like everybody talked about it as a has been company that used to be great and when i left it did a big acquisition that failed and carl i can the famous private equity guy he came in as an activist shareholder and forced them to reverse that big acquisition and those are like late stage end of life of a company kind of events right and then eventually fuji from japan bought xerox and now it's part of fuji xerox and that's like literally at the end brand harvesting so uh, i didn't do this consciously but i enter- entered towards the end in like its last hope of being a great company again and then i exited when it was kind of clear that it was game over and silicon yes. valley i would say i entered uh, when it was on its um, i would say third boom so 80 silicon valley had one boom around the pc 90 silicon valley had one boom around like the web 1.0 and internet and then mm-hmm. 2005 to 6 social media was the third wave of silicon valley and i kind of joined that when it was uh, heating up and i think and i shouldn't say this out loud but i think i'm on the cusp of exiting silicon valley because i think it's sort of dying i don't know what i, I was going to say like as soon as you said silicon valley i was like oh no man cat this is like oh that's not good for sp it's been like adding it's, it to the system but this has happened to like innovation scenes a lot like uh, the new york innovation scene was like this in like the 18 18- 80s and 1890s the Connecticut Valley around Springfield Armory um that whole area was the silicon valley of its time and for like 20 years huge amounts of like early industrial consumer technology came out of that region and then yeah. at some point it got financialized the manufacturing and textile industries moved further west it became a financial center of tech instead of a tech center same thing is happening to silicon valley Yeah. The banks moved in. Oh my god, Jane Jacobs talks about what happens when the banks move into a neighborhood. And like it doesn't even you could extend that metaphor from like a neighborhood to a industry, right? Like when the bankers yep. show up and like start colonizing space and like taking out 
big offices and like the nice parts of town, um, <laughs> yeah. whatever that is, like the industry version of taking out an office in the nice parts of town, usually is a sign that that like neighborhood is like fully gentrified because the banks don't move in yep. until the gentrification is complete. Like the bank rolling in is like a post peak move. And it can happen in waves, right? Like um, the San Francisco area has had at least, um, let's see, probably two or three big sort of economic cycles. Like there was the gold rush and there was probably something to do with uh, uh, Asia shipping. Like that's where I think the tea clippers used to go, I think, from China trade. So there was like several areas, like Seattle also. Seattle had its gold rush, then a lumber and you know, timber industry, then a railroad. So mm -hmm. it, it sort of goes in waves and each wave comes with its own financialization and bankers moving in. But I think it has to go through a decline in between because otherwise property values don't come down enough. Like right now, even if San Francisco and the Bay Area are sort of ripe for another round of like, you know, whatever, economic boom and bust, um, it can't happen until like real estate goes through its cycle. That's why even like Silicon Valley companies are like choosing to grow outside or like leaving. Like I think LA is... Um, a big area for like expat uh, Silicon Valley yeah. techies who, are, who now think LA is a better place to build, right? Yep, and, Austin too. Austin also has been benefiting from that. I think Seattle, maybe Portland to a small extent. Um, Seattle and Portland, I think are the oldest ones and they've been, I think, refugee areas for a different re uh, reason. That's where people go to raise families, I think, or I like, uh, and even within those regions, like between Amazon and Microsoft in Seattle, there's a circulation pattern and stuff. Uh, but I think something new is happening now. Like it's not just people maturing in their career. It's literally Silicon Valley has become too expensive, too poorly governed. I mean, and I saw it happen when I, I was only in SF for two years, maybe. Hmm. And um, I had a great time when I wasn't freezing cold. But um, like, uh, <laughs> the... Um, Within me leaving San Francisco, I like got into the blockchain space while I lived out there. I used Bitcoin specifically, which is a little different than the generic blockchain. Like the blockchain space is a lot different. You can like kind mm -hmm. of stuff. There's like a world of Bitcoin inside the blockchain universe. Yep. Um, I think that's a good um, thing. And of all the people I know that were working in the Bitcoin world, I think like most of us have moved out of SF and like the one or two I know are still there's like a couple people that are there because their company is there and like the company's not going to leave anytime soon as far as I understand um, maybe that's changed in the last six months but the only other person I know from that space is like looking at moving out um because it was weird yes. I went from having a bunch of friends and then we all just left like one went to Bulgaria one went to LA one went to a couple went to New York City anyways yeah, it's kind of interesting that the crypto boom is one where a lot of uh, Silicon Valley techies were involved, uh, both as investors or uh, like programmers. But the center of gravity was never in Silicon Valley. Like starting with you know Satoshi, nobody knows where or who, who that person is. Yeah. But, it's uh, the first truly distributed like tech movement, I think, and yeah. that's fair and it's interesting. It's like yeah. this is and, tech. and it truly is a new sort of um, a new Silicon Valley that's basically not in physical geography. Like people claim that, for example, Ethereum is in Zug in Switzerland, but not really. It's like yeah, yeah a couple of the primary people are there, but the thing itself is a little too distributed. Um, yeah, and but but I think geography does matter, uh, and it's um, Silicon Valley is going through like some sort of terminal decline in its current form. Like we've had like three waves within its current form with the same sort of pattern of institutions and Silicon Valley venture cap, venture firms and Sand Hill Road. But it's like something is different this time. Like the best sign I can think of is I first went to Silicon Valley on sort of a work-like trip, um, I think 2007, 2008. And between then and now, uh, I often end up in Palo Alto. And Palo Alto University Avenue area is sort of my litmus test area of like tech. And the first few times I went, it was like a happening scene. Everybody sort of, Koopa Cafe on Ramona was sort of the uh, place you went to if you wanted to eavesdrop on people pitching VCs, bad startups and stuff. It's become mm -hmm. like a ghost town now. Like nobody's there. It's completely empty. And part of the reason is it's all moved uh, uh, up to the city proper and then from the city to East Bay. But it's like migration 
explains only part of it. There's actual shrinkage in sort of the vitality across the region. It's like now getting restricted to a few pockets. Yeah, and I think I'm sure the pandemic will change some of that also. Like it's, the pandemic has been like a bit of an accelerationist movement, I think. Yep. Um, so I'm interested to see kind of like the next few years how things move forward. Because I think it'll be- In a way you could say the pandemic is accelerating a specific trend, which is uh, Silicon Valley is basically filling up. Like if you look at the map of Silicon Valley, San Jose at the bottom, that's the that's where it started, right? Because all the semiconductor companies are there, Intel and AMD and stuff. But that's like kind of full. It's like dead suburban, exurban like wasteland. Then you go yeah. up to the middle part of um, Peninsula, you end up with uh, uh, the social media companies. Google and Facebook have their campuses there. So that's full yeah. now. And then you move to the bedroom communities. Um, there's like, nobody wants to be there, I think. And then the city proper is now getting full, uh, full, but also has this conflict with the city people. And then East Bay, I think, will soon get full. So it, it's run out of room, basically. Each region has its own subculture. Yeah. As the universe of the valley, it is like each of the worlds has kind of like reached a saturation it's, point, it sounds like. Yeah, I have this theory that universes are kind of like living things that have a life death cycle, but towards the end, they kind of like become fully realized versions of themselves, but they're like at the, uh, it's the Baroque point in um, art. Like there's this definition of the Baroque uh, due to Borges, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian writer. Mm -hmm. And his definition is a thing is Baroque when you cannot parody it because it's become a parody of itself, like an extreme thing, right? And it can be extreme uh -huh. in multiple ways. Like it can be like completely ornate with like over the top, like um, architectural yeah. embellishments, or it can be extremely minimalist and that's Baroque in its own way. And mm -hmm. Silicon Valley I think is at its Baroque stage now, like you can't parody it. Like uh, I saw, like I got yeah. bored with one season of Silicon Valley, the HBO show, because it's like, this is not parody or satire. This is kind of literally how it is. It's a documentary, yeah. yeah. It's like, it's plays as a documentary. I mean, I feel like the United States has also entered its parochial phase, if that's the definition yep. of Baroque, because, and like, I have this, like, essay I wrote in college about The Onion, the newspaper, um, which was, like, a decade, over a decade ago now. I was just like kind of this sad lament for Onion the newspaper. It was like it was me sitting on like sitting on the ground looking at like you know the old style um, newspaper bins where you could go and get a new the copy out and read it. And so it's kind of like oh poor Onion who will read you now like the parodies write themselves. And I think I was very I think I was more ahead of my time than I knew um, because even within the last like four years like that prophecy has basically become true. Like people. It was like, it's, it's been like a well-known joke that, um, you know, Onion had something to write about because like the United yeah. States politics is so baroque, like bro baroqueal, is that a thing? Um, I don't know if baroqueal is a thing, but it should be. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we should make that our first official word of Scorpio season. But yeah, I, I totally agree. Like, uh, and it's literally happened that The Onion has published a story uh, in the last few years. It, the Onion will publish a story and then you realize that just within a day or two of the onion story, something real happened that you really can't tell apart. And it's become like yeah. a, 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 it's, it's a cliche now, right? Like not the onion is um, a, co a comment you make about a news story. Yeah. And, uh, of all the most Baroque parts of the US, I think Florida is the most Baroque um, part. I mean, that's why we have Florida man and uh, like anything obviously absurd and extreme that looks like it's from the onion it turns out it's from florida yeah i heard this was because something about like the sunshine laws about open books made it easier for people to go into records and see what was going on at like police stations oh is it huh, yeah so, like supposedly i mean just so like weird stuff that happens in florida is a lot easier to find out about because they have good sunshine laws so like florida man you can hear about Florida Man because we can see what's going on with Florida Man, whereas other places it's not as easy to see. Also, they do have like some weird shit that happens down there, let's be real. Like, we don't have alligators in other places. So that brings us around full circle. Florida is a place where the underground is above ground. It's like not <laughs> past the uncanny portal or something. So it's like literally above ground, underground. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. 
Yeah. Are we, um, are we at 345? I think we're at 345, yeah. Yes, so we didn't get to the unknown, but we can uh, talk about that the next time we circle back to the U. At X, or at X, talk about X. Oh yeah, X is the unknown. <laughs> X marks X the unknown. Is the unknown. All right, so I think we've uh, run out of use to talk about. It's, uh, it's an, a U upset, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. Um, no. Um, I was upset a couple of days back with moving crap, but I'm not upset today. Oh, it's good to hear, Venkat. <laughs> I'm glad you've uh, resolved your unhappiness. Um, You're trying really hard to manufacture use now. Unfortunately, I think we've reached the end of this episode. Um, <laughs> so I will see you next week on Scorpio season. See you next week. All right. Bye. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.